I fell in love with the American West in 1999 when I was doing some consulting for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and stepped off the plane in Jackson Hole and looked at the Tetons. And I had a free day and I spent 14 hours on the road up in Yellowstone and I've never really turned back. I've been very fortunate to travel to 25 foreign countries and 30 parks. I've spent almost 200 days in Yellowstone. So tonight's presentation will be uh, a summary of some lessons learned and some of my misadventures. And uh, I'll be sharing some stories and some images. So this first image is uh, Jennifer and I, my wife, uh, two years ago, uh, headed off to the Canadian Rockies. And this is me standing at uh, top of one of the uh, climbs that we had in Jasper National Park. And I would just highly recommend if you have an opportunity to get out to Calgary and then you're only about an hour and a half to Banff and Jasper and Yoho National Parks. And they're really quite stunning. And the Canadians are doing a much better job than we are in terms of managing their parks. So today's adventures will include a little bit about the history of the parks and uh, some lessons learned and staying out of trouble. And we'll go to Bryce and Zion National Parks out in Utah. Uh, Glacier, one of my favorites, and we'll go to Yellowstone. And uh, we'll talk about loving our parks to death. And uh, if you're planning a trip, it's probably too late for this year. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the uh, the parks were come under the Antiqu Antiquities Act. Uh, that was established and in 1916, there was another act established that really gave the park service uh, supervision and um, domain over the parks. And there's actually 400 units under the National Park Service. There are now 62 national parks, close to uh, 40, 400 national monuments and uh, national preserves. And uh, that estimate of 350 million users is, is gonna be just blown away this year. Um, when I was in Yellowstone in 2019, we had 4.4 million visitors. And last year alone in August and July, we had a million visitors. So it's been a real challenge in managing the parks and the demand. So what I'd like to do is to start off with uh, how I spent my vacation in Lorraine. Would you please tell me if the music comes on on this or if it doesn't? Sure. Can you hear music? No. Okay. So for those of you who are watching, normally what would happen is you would be listening to some music, but for some reason it doesn't. So this is Zion National Park. This is one of the five national parks in Utah. And Zion is one of the more unique parks in the system. It's basically a road up a canyon for nine miles. And there is now only shuttle service. You can't be driving your car. And if you Google 10 most dangerous hikes in the United States, this is Angel's Landing. I'll let you enjoy it for a few minutes. So you start out on the canyon floor and you start walking. And a couple of lessons learned here are helpful and I'll try and incorporate them in as I go along. Number one, uh, you should not do this if there's bad weather. My son did it and uh, ended up with a lightning strike very close to him. You wanna have very good hiking shoes. If you notice the gentleman on this trip has a pair of gloves because the last quarter mile, half mile is all chains. And um, you have to hold on to the chains so that you don't go down 2000 feet. And um, there's been about eight, eight maybe nine deaths. Um, and it's become so popular that you now have to have a registration to, to hike here. So like a lot of parks, I'm heading out to Rocky Mountain National Park this year in June and there are reservation systems in place. So many of the parks, Arcadia, Yosemite, are requiring reservations. 
and you have to get them before you get there. This is a stunning hike. It uh, takes about two hours. Uh, there are 23 switchbacks as you go up. And when it talks about Angel's Landing, it's basically a staircase to the top of this stunning view of the valley. So when you're in Zion, you're basically looking back down the valley. So this person is wearing sneakers, which is a really bad idea. Not wearing a hat, which is not a good idea. And it's really helpful to have the right equipment, the right gear, and understand your limits. Not everybody should do this hike. My main lesson learned is respect your age, your environment, and your experience. And I think this video really captures that. So here's a list that I like to provide for clients. I help individuals and groups and organizations plan their trips. And these are my 10 lessons learned for the park and the 10 essentials for safe hiking. So I'll go through them very quickly, but you have to plan ahead. The parks are basically sold out for reservations this year for lodging. I recommend to clients and friends and family that you have to look at six months to a year now to be able to get the lodging that you want. You'll also have to plan ahead to get access to some of the parks. Acadia is close to me and they have a very restrictive uh, system now to get up to Cadillac Mountain. If you're going to do some hiking, here are all the things you need. I would encourage everybody who goes out, regardless of how much time you're gonna spend on a trail, having the right footwear really makes a difference because you're gonna be walking around. Most important is respecting your ability, your age, and the environment. And I've seen some very stupid behavior, I refer to it as Darwin behavior, where people put themselves and others at risk. And it's really critical that you know that if you're going out with a group of six people and one of them is not a very good hiker, the rule of the trail is that you never leave anybody behind so just understand when you're getting out there and you're getting into the wilderness you have some responsibility for yourself and others it's helpful to buy the right gear because the closer you get to the park the more expensive it is i really encourage you to keep a journal and uh, one of the exercises that i do every time is ask the group to say what was the highlight was what was the lesson learned and i'll get it more into some lessons learned in a minute Safety first, uh, I spent a lot of time in Yellowstone and the Tetons and Glacier. So one of the first things I do is purchase a can of air spray. It's important to know how to use it. And uh, each of the parks has a newsletter and they talk about safety precautions, but there are quite a few deaths in all our national parks every year and drowning automobile accidents and falls are the top three. Uh, do your homework. Uh, the, the more you uh, do some homework on the park, the more you're going to enjoy it. And the National Park website services are terrific. Um, they have a whole section on planning your visit. They have multimedia. You'll really have a much richer experience if you learn about the park and in its history. I highly recommend getting up early. Avoid the crowds. You see more wildlife. And pace yourself. Uh, set your priorities. You can't do everything in the park. So here's an example of uh, essentials if you're heading out for a hike. And uh, it's really important to have these tools with you uh, if you're gonna be going off trail. So Zion and Bryce are two of my favorite parks. They're located in Utah. I usually fly into Las Vegas because it's shorter than falling, uh, 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 flying into uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, Bryce is very different from Zion, even though they're only about 90 minutes away. So you fly into Salt Lake City or you fly into Las Vegas. And the drive from Las Vegas to Zion is about two hours. And then to Bryce, it's about another hour and a half. And then you also have uh, some other national parks that I'll talk about in a second as well. These are my two good friends from graduate school at Hopkins. And we're on our way up to Angel's Landing. Uh, we're at one of the uh, turnoffs. 
and uh, the light in Zion is really quite stunning. Uh, mornings and evenings have, uh, I've seen some beautiful sunsets around the world. And I, I have to think that Zion is one of my favorite. This is what a morning looks like. There's only one lodge in Zion. All the other lodging is in the gateway cities uh, outside of the park. And that lodging's probably been sold out for all of this year and probably most of next year at this point. So there's Angel's Landing. There's my young son, Will, heading up. And he won the Knucklehead Award. Uh, he and his uh, girlfriend went out and failed to look at the weather report and had a very close encounter with a lightning strike. And uh, you just have to pay attention when you're out there. Zion, uh, the road is closed, but you can rent a bicycle and it's really terrific. Zion is next to probably Yosemite, the most popular national park for climbing climbers. And so behind me is 1500 feet of sheer rock and almost every day, there's between 10 and 20 very serious climbers going up there. This is my lovely wife, Jennifer. We travel a lot together to the parks. So you get in the car, you go about an hour and a half and you're off to uh, Bryce. And Bryce is so different from Zion. Zion is basically one, one huge valley. And Bryce is made up of about seven amphitheaters made out of carved out of limestone. And it, it does look like the moon. If you've never seen the hoodoos, this is what they look like. Uh, the, the color is, is quite fantastic, um, particularly during the day. The sun changes the dynamic in the shades. This is Jennifer with her best friend, Jacqueline. And Bryce is huge. And this is what you see. And if you go to Bryce, I highly recommend getting up before dawn and they have a sunrise lookout in a uh, evening sunset lookout and uh, get a good spot because the colors as you can see here we were here in march and there was some snow on the ground so it's even more spectacular when you have that one of the lessons learned from bryce is we took uh, jacqueline and her husband peter out went for a hike and didn't bring a map and didn't know how far we were out and Jacqueline was not that strong a hiker and it was a little bit of a challenge, you know, getting her back to the car. So uh, a lesson learned is always bring your park map and know what trail you're on. Um, we knew the trail was about six miles, but we didn't know quite what our location was. And we probably could have turned around earlier, but um, I won the Knucklehead Award that day. So Canyonlands is another park in Utah. Um, you fly out to Salt Lake City, you drive down and you hit Canyonlands. You can also hit Capitol Reef. And uh, two of my favorite spots that are not on here are Bears Ear and Grand Escalante. Grand Escalante. Um, thank God President Biden uh, put those parks back where they should be. Uh, there's very strong uh, interest in, 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 in Utah to mine these locations for some very precious metals. And uh, we have to pay better attention to our national parks. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So Canyon, Canyonlands is quite stunning. Um, there are really three areas of the park. One is Island in the Sky, uh, where the Green and the Colorado Rivers come together. Another one is the Maze. And again, if you do, if you Google 10 most dangerous hikes, the Maze comes up as usually number three or four. And then you have the needles where you have a, a, a large variety of uh, destination points that you can actually see. Um, if you're a, if you're not much of a hiker, you should stay away from the maze and uh, just enjoy the sights from the island and the sky and the needles. So my good friend Bruce and I do a lot of these adventures together and we use this really terrific group called Rim Tours. And they met us uh, in Green uh, River and drove us out uh, and then we got on our mountain bikes and did uh, 15 to 20 miles of mountain biking on slip rock and desert in high plains uh, set up camp 
Uh, they said, go, go put up your tent, but be careful. That's where we had the scorpions and rattlesnakes last week. So, uh, again, it's not for everybody, but if you're an adventurer, there's some really outstanding ways to see the parks. I had never done a, a, a bike trip in a park. Some parks like uh, Yellowstone don't allow you to take the, the bikes off trail. And uh, it was a little nippy, uh, but uh, Canyonlands is just unbelievable in terms of its its scenery. So we camped on a uh, basically a cliff that was a thousand feet high, and this is looking down at night to uh, what's called chocolate drops. And this is what chocolate drops looks like during the daytime. Um, a lot of a Native American art throughout the park. Um, this was actually taken in another park, but there's a there's quite a bit of uh, petroglyphs and pictographs uh, throughout Canyonlands as well. This is the harvest panel for those of you who are familiar with it. Uh, Canyonlands is just big country. Um, and I would highly recommend if you're going to go into the park and do some hiking that you have a guide because I couldn't imagine what we would have done without the guides to get us in and out of the uh, of the maze. So the Badlands are in South Dakota. Uh, our motto for this trip was what could possibly go wrong. I took my good friend Ted Kohler, who had just re retired as a vascular surgeon up in Seattle. We headed off for a uh, about a five day trip. We hit uh, the Jewel Cave and Wind Cave and a couple of others in the Badlands and had a in the Black Hills of uh, South Dakota and Wyoming. It was quite stunning. So, if you saw the movie Nomad Land, uh, she was a caretaker in Canyonlands in, in the Badlands National Park. And it looks like I've never been, but this looks like what the moon would look like to me. Um, it's, uh, it reminded me a lot of the Danakil Desert in Ethiopia, uh, extremely barren, uh, very fragile, uh, limestone. Um, you have to be very careful. Uh, there are no guardrails. Uh, you drop down and you're going to drop anywhere between 40 and 400 feet. So you want to pay a lot of attention. Uh, the, the shadows change throughout the day. And it's one of the more stunning visuals that I've seen in the parks. So here's an example of <clears throat> lesson learned. You don't want to go down, uh, just scramble down these uh, cliffs, uh, because if you go down, it's pretty easy to go down, but it's pretty hard to come up because it's so fragile. And I had a friend who actually got stuck there and if it hadn't been for a ranger doing an evening patrol, he, he could probably still be there. So the other thing that you'll notice here is uh, you have to pay attention to rattlesnakes. And a lesson learned is pay attention to the environment. But if you take a look at me, I have a hat, I have a sun mask, I'm completely covered. I, you can't see it on my hands, but I have gloves covering my hands. And uh, when you're in this kind of environment, the sun can be really brutal and when you're at six, seven, 8,000 feet, it doesn't take long to be a crispy critter. Oh, here's a lesson learned. We put uh, Badlands uh, G, uh, into our GPS, and what we failed to, fail to recognize was that the Badlands is actually made up of two units, the North unit and the South unit. And we went to the South unit and almost ran out of gas. And it is one of the most desolate areas in the United States that I've ever been. So um, another lesson learned is check the GPS and check the map and make sure you're going to the right unit of the park. Um, another example of a park that has units is Theodore Roosevelt. They actually have three different sections. So here's a good friend at UNH and he's a, he's a traveler. This was his tent set up in Badlands National Park. So let's go to Glacier. Uh, this is my good friend, Peter, on an April trip. And the uh, runoff is just tremendous. Uh, 
I've seen some beautiful waterfalls in Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland and Austria, but I got to tell you the the waterfalls during the the snow melt and glacier rival anything I've seen anywhere in the world. So getting to glacier, uh, you fly out to. I like to fly into uh, Kalispell. You can also fly into Spokane. And I highly recommend if you're going to go to Glacier National Park that you also go to Waterton National Park. I like to stay in Whitefish. It's a kind of an upscale place to stay, and there's a very good skiing there, the Whitefish Mountain. So here's a typical itinerary that I put together for clients and groups. Um, I basically outline where to go, where to stay. Here's an example of all the different places to go. And I would highly recommend if you go to Glacier, Glacier, you get your passport and go up to the Prince of Wales because the Prince of Wales, um, well, Waterton National Park is the park, but the Prince of Wales is, I've stayed in some beautiful hotels around the world. and It's probably my favorite hotel of any place I've ever been in terms of visuals. So that's an example of uh, what I do for clients and others, and I highly recommend that you visit the National Park Service website before you get to the park because uh, and pick out what you want to do and how you want to do it. Because you can never get everything done. I could, you could spend, I could spend three weeks in Glacier and never hit the same trail twice. One of my favorite places to stay is the Isaac Walton Inn. It used to be the home for railroad workers. It's the it's, it's the highest pass in the country for railroads that comes across this pass. The trains are still running. And, and if you look in the background in the woods are three cabooses. There are two that you can see, but these are completely outfitted. I think they cost about 370 to 400 dollars a night uh, running water, flush toilets, uh, small kitchen. And it, it's an amazing place to stay. A lot of people like to go out there for cross country skiing. And the trains run all night, so bring your earplugs. And the entire uh, hotel, the Isaac Walton, is filled with memorabilia from uh, the railroads. My dad and my grandfather worked on the Boston Maine Railroad, so uh, railroads have a special place for me. Lots of bears and grizzlies. Uh, Black bears as well as grizzlies. Um, if you go 100 yards off the trail, you've got to have bear spray. You've got to know how to use it. Um, got to be very sensitive. Uh, there's, a, there's a book called The Night of the Grizzlies where many years ago, two people were mauled to death on the same night in two different locations in, in Glacier. Oh, let's uh, another, another lesson learned. Uh, Glacier used to have 150 glaciers. I believe the latest count is down to 25. Um, many people, many experts believe that there won't be a glacier left in Glacier National Park by 2030. So climate change is real and it's having a tremendous impact on our national parks. And I'll say a little bit about how it's affecting Yellowstone as well. This is Lake McDonald. And there are three national lodges uh, uh, in the park, uh, East Glacier Lodge, Many Glacier Lodge, and uh, Lake McDonald Lodge. And this is Lake McDonald, so you actually have the lodge, but you also have cabins. Uh, one thing to pay a lot of attention to in the parks is drowning is a big, uh, a big problem. And the water is very fast. And uh, it's, it's quite common every year for uh, multiple drownings in all of our parks, particularly Yellowstone and Glacier. Uh, this is going to the Sun Road. It's the only road that goes through the park. It's closed from about oh, July 10th through October the 10th. And they literally have to take huge bulldozers and plows to clear the road. It's one of the more spectacular things I've ever seen. But here's a lesson learned. A couple of years ago, a law enforcement officer was taking his day off. He uh, took his mountain bike, 
uh, just where I'm standing, and he rode up the for a pretty good distance. I'll show you how far he rode up. But he was about a mile up the road, and the grizzly came out, uh, took him off the bike, mauled him, and killed him. He did not have his bear spray. So um, anytime you're in bear country, you have to assume that there were bears. Lots of wildlife. So another lesson learned is our national parks are on fire, like a lot of the West. This is a result of a fire several years ago. So even though you make plans, my brother, for example, two years, three years ago, planned to spend a month in Glacier. He spent four days because of the fires. So, you know, April, May, June, July, probably okay. But once you get into July, August, September, um, parks can be a real challenge in terms of the forest fires. Lots of hummingbirds. So Glacier is um, very different from Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons. This is a typical morning hike for us. Uh, it's just spectacular. This is East Glacier, and even if you can't get a reservation, make sure you get in there for a drink because these are stunning national treasures. So here's the boys clearing the uh, snow, uh, probably 20 feet of snow. I don't know how they find the road. And uh, that's as far as we could go that day. Uh, So this is Many Glacier uh, Lake. And if you notice another lake, uh, the silt comes down from the glaciers and has this kind of green, blue, silver. Uh, it's, it's really quite spectacular. You don't have anything like this at all in the east. This is by far my favorite hotel. This is the Many Glacier Hotel. And if you go, ask for room 142. And room 142 is right around the corner. You literally have a small balcony and you look over the lake. And this is Mount Grinnell. Uh, during the summertime, you can uh, take a boat across. Otherwise, you've got to hike all the way up. And there's a Grinnell Glacier up here that's almost gone. It's one of my favorite hikes in the park. Uh, here's another lesson learned. Uh, this is one of my favorite guides out in uh, Glacier. Uh, Rob is the author of several books on the crown of the continent, which is referred to as uh, Glacier. And uh, we went out for a three-day uh, program sponsored by the Glacier Institute. All of the national parks, most of the national parks, the large ones have nonprofit uh, organizations that run education programs. So we're walking down the trail and he goes, oh my God. And he comes up to this tree and he says, do you know what this is? And we said, no, well, this is basically a grizzly mailbox. They urinate on it, they scratch it, they claw it. And um, he took off his black hat and found about six different grizzly hairs. And this is the advantage of going with somebody who is a guide for a day. Um, the park rangers provide guide, uh, provide uh, some educational programs, but all of the parks have uh, private guides and tours. And it really makes a difference when you're out there and you have a greater appreciation for where you are. Let's go to Yellowstone. This is my youngest son, Will. Uh, for his college graduation, I took him, him and uh, his two best friends and their dads, and we did five days in the Tetons and five days in Yellowstone. And this normally would be um, a TV broadcast that you could hear, but for some reason, the technology doesn't allow me to do it. So you're gonna watch a reporter for an incident that happened in Yellowstone uh, a couple of years ago. So this guy gets out of his car, he's drunk. He did the same thing, same, same thing in the Grand Tetons and he, harassed this 
1,200 pound, 1,400 pound male bison. Male bison are um, very ornery. They're very dangerous. Uh, they run up to 30 miles an hour. Uh, I've seen people gored. And uh, this fellow was lucky to get back alive from this one. He was arrested uh, up in Glacier National Park. They got his car license plate. And he was making the rounds. But just really, really bad behavior. And uh, if you go to the parks and you spend enough time, you'll watch some pretty unbelievable behavior. So 2,000 pounds. So Yellowstone is uh, our first national park, uh, 1872, 2.2 million acres. And uh, I usually like to fly into Bozeman, uh, Montana. Bozeman is the home of uh, Montana State University. Um, the Museum of the Rockies is there. Great food, expensive hotel rooms now. And Bozeman, as a friend of mine now says, is called Bose Angeles. It's it's not the town that I loved 20 years ago. It's it's really changed. So you go to Bozeman, you drive down to Livingston, and you come in, and Yellowstone is basically two figure eights. So you've got the top of the eight in here, and uh, you can also fly into Cody. You can also fly into Jackson and drive up through Grand, Ta Grand Teton National Park as well. So this is basically the, the map that you get from the rangers uh, at the ranger station. It gives you the location and the mileage between all of the different locations. Yellowstone Lake is over here. This upper area up here is called the Northern Range. Old Faithful is in this area. Uh, West Thumb in uh, West Thumb is over by the over by the lake. So I spent almost 12 years in Glacier in the summertime. Uh, helping out with the volunteer fly fishing program. And uh, these are some pictures that I've captured over my time there. So there's the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, uh, two spectacular waterfalls. This is the, the the lower falls at 318 feet, and the upper falls is just above it at about 118 feet. Uh, half of the world's thermal features are in Yellowstone National Park. So you have hot pots, fumaroles, geysers in hot springs. Lots of wildlife, they're everywhere. My favorite is the otter. I, when I come back in my next life, I wanna be an otter. All they do is swim and eat and uh, play and make love. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good life out there on the river. A coyote. This is a black wolf that was about 30, 40 feet from us at Slough Creek. Very unusual to get a picture of a wolf this close. Uh, full of elk, very dangerous animal, particularly in breeding season. Grizzlies, moose, pronghorn. So bison are everywhere. Uh, when we would go out to participate in the volunteer fly fishing program, we stayed in the basically a double wide trailer and we'd have visitors with us almost every day. One night I was supposed to go have dinner with my brother who was camping at a campsite, but it took a half hour because we had 200 bison outside of our door. Very dangerous animal. I've had five close encounters. I've never had a close encounter with a bear, but there's close to 5,000 bison in the park and they show up in the most unusual places. This is my oldest son, Luke. I took him out for some fly fishing with a friend. And this is referred to as a shed. Uh, one of the more unusual ones having, usually you'll find the skull or the, uh, the antlers. And one of the, one of the regulations of the park is you have to leave everything just where you found it. So Luke picked it up and put it back exactly where he found it. May and June, um, if you're into wild uh, wildflowers, uh, some of the most 
beautiful meadows. So these next images are from a photographer in Great Britain. Um, several years ago, I took the Phillips Exeter Academy biology department out, uh, the teachers, and now students go out every year. I help school groups and others plan their trips. And uh, I, I shuttled off the, the faculty to a naturalist and I had the day to go fly fishing. And of course, there was a bear jam, which refers to about 100 to 200 cars in the middle of the road. And uh, the reason that they stopped was, I'll show you in a second, but this guy sent me a couple images that I thought I'd share with you. So this is why everybody was stopped. Uh, this big guy was probably 75 yards off the road. Uh, he was on this kill for two or three days. And um, you just get a different feeling when you're in the park, when you're not at the not at the top of the food chain. So uh, lots of eagles and osprey. And this next picture is my National Geographic picture. I'm standing in the Firehole River one morning and I'm uh, fly fishing. And uh, like a knucklehead, I did not have my bear spray with me because I was only, you know, 75 yards from the parking lot. I wasn't paying attention. And the next thing I knew, there was a splash behind me. I thought, oh, I'm dead. But what had happened is an offspray had come down and taken this beautiful fish right behind me. And there was a park ranger who uh, was doing some photography next to me and captured it. But you know, if you spend enough time in the park, you'll see these kind of uh, images. And I'll, I'll fish that same spot and see a variety of uh, osprey coming down the rivers looking for fish. Trumpeter swans. This is the Lamar Valley. This is referred to as the Serengeti of the United States. And I've spent three months in the Serengeti in Africa, and I can tell you it's it's not the Serengeti of Africa, but it's pretty damn good. So this is a, a morning, and here's the next morning. So Yellowstone's at seven to eight to ten thousand feet. Uh, I've seen snow in every month when it, since I've been out there. So if you're going to seven thousand, eight thousand feet, bring the right gear. Um, also get acclimated. Another lesson learned is many people will go from New Hampshire to eight ten thousand feet and feel terrible sleeping. So I highly recommend um, getting acclimated, spend a night in Bozeman at 5,000 feet, walk around a lot, and then get up to the park at eight and 9,000 feet. Good example of a catcher's mitt. That's actually a, a grizzly paw. So I was part of a volunteer fly fishing program with my brother, Paul, who's right there with our friend. And the reason there's a volunteer fly for ocean program is some knuckleheads back in the 80s uh, took buckets and took lake trout from one of the lakes, Shoshone Lake and Lewis Lake, and brought it over to Yellowstone Lake. And these big guys eat about 52 cutthroat a, a year. And when the first fish were supported in 1984, by the end of the, at the beginning of the 90s, the trout, the cutthroat population had gone down 95%. So for the last 30 years, the park and others have been investing about $3 million a year to mitigate the, the lake trout. They're still in there. This is what their prized possession is, is a, uh, an iconic Yellowstone cutthroat. And the volunteer program is we would catch, fit, catch fish, put them in our yellow bucket, bring back to a coordinator, and we take DNA samples and we would see how well the re restoration of the cutthroat was. So we get an assignment, we'd go out, the scientist would uh, do the clipping, we do all the DNA samples, uh, this is a grayling. So we'd catch some beautiful fish. Some of the volunteers would bring their young, uh, would bring their children or their grandchildren to join us for a week. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer in the park. And 
one of the lessons is take advantage of it. So the websites will have a, a variety of options that you can look at for volunteering. Uh, this is one of my favorite trips in the park. Uh, this is up Slough Creek. I hadn't been on a horse in about 30 years. I had a great wrangler, really appreciated him when he came up on the grizzly bear about a mile up the trail. So you have to realize that Slough Creek, you're at about 7,500 feet. You climb to about oh, probably 8,000 feet. And on each side of you, you have mountain ranges that go up 1,000 feet. It's one of the more unbelievable adventures I've done in the last couple of years. Here's why we go to Yellowstone and catch some beautiful cutthroat. This is uh, fishing on Trout Lake. You get a belly boat and you catch fish as big as my arm. So sometimes we had very small creeks and smaller creeks in really small creeks. And this is what we call dabbing for brookies. So it's really quite spectacular to be on the river and uh, seeing the thermal features. So this is yours truly uh, with one of his biggest fish of my life. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you just a little bit about what that's like. Normally there's a, some video with this. Uh, I won't bore you with it, but it's pretty exciting. Uh, I was up to my waist by the time when I first caught this fish and I've been playing it for 20 minutes. It's probably a 26, 25 inch rainbow trout on the Madison River. Um, we're at about 7,000 feet. I have beautiful mountain ranges all around me. I'm trying not to fall down. Um, in view in a second is my favorite guide out there, Nate Stavane. I've been with him for about 15 years. And Nate is trying to position himself so that he can catch and land this fish. It's all catch and release. Um, this is regarded, the Madison River is regarded as one of the premier streams for trout fishing in the United States. I usually spend between two and three weeks a year out in Montana fly fishing. I'll cut the video, but after 25 minutes, I lost the fish, but it was still a thrill of a lifetime. Uh, this is a typical day. So one of my favorite places to stay in the park is uh, something that's run by Yellowstone Forever. That's the 501c3 that does all the educational programs. And these are a series of cabins in um, Gardner, Montana that overlook the park. And if you sign up with Yellowstone Forever, you can get this and do a, a program with them. I really enjoy Yellowstone in the wintertime. Um, I, I recommend now to everybody I talk to, don't go to Yellowstone from June 15th through September 15th. Uh, it's basically a uh, parking lot and it's not gonna be the user experience that you think it could be or should be. Um, we're really loving our parks to death in the United States and we need to address it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So you can sign up with Yellowstone forever. They what they do is they uh, take the vans and take off the tires and put on this rake. A couple of years ago, I took the UNH Alumni Association and approached them and said, I'd like to put a trip together. And they said, sure. So I took eight alumni out. These are some images for our trip. You often don't see a bison waiting to make a telephone call. Uh, waterfalls throughout the park in the wintertime. Uh, this is an old bombardier. There were six of us in this contraption. And all the roads are closed in Yellowstone, except for one in the north side. So the, the bison like to stay on the roads with you because it's much less energy for them to work. So the, you uh, sign up for the program. Uh, they give you all the skis, snowshoes. Uh, you ride in these contraptions uh, out to beautiful places. And you're on your skis, and you can see the elk around the thermal features because it's such a nice, warm area.
So here's an example. This is me in the foreground here. We're out hiking in, in 1988, um, almost a third of the park, 37% burned. Um, one of the greatest uh, acreages of fire at the time in our national parks. And uh, we've learned a lot of lessons about forest fires in the parks and how important they are for the ecosystem. But another example of uh, Mother Nature playing tricks on us or working with us to keep the environment the way it should be. Not always the way we want it to be, though. Here's an example of uh, the cross country hiking, and we have a warming hut with a fire and some hot chocolate. But that's a typical morning for you in Yellowstone. You're at about 8,000, 9,000 feet. Uh, there are four peaks in Yellowstone at, at, that have 10,000 feet. Um, it's just an amazing adventure to be out there in the park. I was doing a presentation up at Kittery Trading Post the other day, and I had a guy in the audience. He said he just got back from the park in uh, three weeks ago, and he said it was the thrill of a lifetime to be out there in the winter time. What's really unusual is the, the the thermals are terrific, but in the winter time, because of the temperature, they're even more. I don't even know what the word is. It's just a, a different environment when the cold hits that steam. So you probably recognize this. This is Old Faithful. And um, usually you have three to 5,000 of your closest friends standing there watching. And I captured this picture. And it was uh, seven o'clock in the morning. I had a cup of coffee and there was not a, another person with me. I had the entire Old Faithful by myself. So in the winter time, the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone actually freezes over and you can cross country ski and snowshoe along the entire rim. Um, it's, it's quite gorgeous to be able to be out there in the winter time, put on your snowshoes or your skis. And there's a trail that goes all the way along this that you can do for five or six miles. This is Yellowstone Lake, the highest lake in the country. And uh, one morning we had uh, wolves coming across. Oh, speaking of wildlife, you know, lots of wildlife in the in the winter time. Mr. Coyote, fox, of course. I ran into this guy just walking down the Blacktail Trail one morning. So this is looking down from the rim of um, the Grand Canyon to the Yellowstone River. And if you're a if you're a downhill skier, I've skied most of the west, but this is Lone Mountain. This is Big Sky, and uh, here's a little report for this year: the snowpack in Montana is eighty percent of what it should be. I have friends who've been to Big Sky twice this year, and a third of the trails were not open due to not, not enough snow. So um, this is our future. This is what it looks like when you're in the front seat of the uh, of the van heading out for another adventure on. Uh, Yellowstone in the wintertime. So now the the ugly part of our national parks. Now you saw some of that with the idiot with the bison. But here's an example of what Yellowstone is like in the summertime. And that's why I tell clients, don't go. So this is a bear jam. 
and people have literally stopped stopped and parked in the middle of the highway and there's only two lanes i mean you're just talking direction there are no passing lanes so this is what yellowstone has become and somehow you would never see this in the canadian rockies uh, people respect the parks they respect other people who are in the parks is my experience but for some reason we just are not We're just not doing what we need to do to protect the land. That's my editorial. So, want to go see the Grand Canyon? Wait four hours. So, lesson learned, Grand Canyon. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, two of my good friends, Buzz and Bruce, uh, we stayed in Flagstaff. We drove over. We were there at 7 o'clock in the morning in the slow season. Parked the car, uh, did a very good trail. Um, 286 people a year, by the way, are rescued out of the Grand Canyon because they walk down and can't walk back up. And when we got back up to the top of the rim, it was snowing. And we looked at each other and said, where did we park the car? Well, there were four huge parking lots at the Grand Canyon. We spent the next hour looking for, car, looking for our car, trying to buzz it with a security key. And it looked like every car in the parking lot was a Malibu Impala rental car from Salt Lake City. So this is what it's like to go to the Grand Canyon on Memorial Day. This is one of my favorite signs from um, Yoho Jasper National Park. Let no one say and say it to your shame that all was beauty here until you came. I think they should have that sign at every national park entrance in the United States. So food for thought. Um, I know I've talked to Lorraine, you have a copy of this in your library. This is the Atlantic Magazine, May 2021. This is the cover story. And uh, return the parks to the tribes. So this is a very powerful article. Uh, it changed my view of the parks in many ways, and I knew about it, but he articulates, you know, we basically, we did. We, th we just said, this is our land now. You can't live here. So when you go to, and this is Glacier National Park. So when you go to Glacier, you have the park boundary, and then across the road, you have the reservation and one of my most disturbing moments is when i was in glacier on a bear trip is we were up at first light and we walked and we, we were in our van and as we were getting into where we wanted to go there was a young girl probably 15 in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt clearly had been abused walking down the road. And um, we stopped and one of the women in the group came out and uh, spent some time with her. But this article will give you a different appreciation of quote, our national parks. And there's a quote in there that I, I still remember. It says, you know, I never thought I'd look at Yellowstone and think of it up as a crime scene. So food for thought. So that's my presentation. This is me at a, a, a dude ranch in uh, the Bitterroot, Absaroka Mountains of uh, Montana. Uh, it's about six o'clock in the morning and I'm up and I'm just welcoming the day. So Lorraine, that's my presentation and I'd be glad to spend some time with any questions or comments that folks have. Great. Thanks so much, John. That was really fantastic information. Um, if anybody has a question for John, please do type it in the chat box, or if you'd like to ask him directly, just let me know that and I can unmute your microphone. John, how did you get so experienced at this? Did you train professionally anyway, or with a group, or did you just join groups and until you felt so, confident to go out on your own? 
So what I did is uh, uh, I, I was on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation assignment. I landed in, te in the Grand Tetons and just said, I'm in love. And I just said, okay. And then I went up to Yellowstone. And then what I did is I took four of the Yellowstone Forever programs. And they have a variety of different ones. So I went out with guides for probably the first 20 days in the parks when I was there. And um, there's nothing like getting experience from folks who are well-trained naturalists. Wow. And I've been fortunate to do a lot of travel uh, for both professionally and personally. So after a while, you just kind of pick up the do's and don'ts. Okay, folks, questions or comments? Everybody's so quiet. We have like 37 people on here. Um, Talk to me a little bit about the bear spray. I'm interested in that personally because I do fear bear, bears when I'm hiking. How does that work? So bear, and so does bear it spray, Yeah, so bear spray does work. It costs you about $45. And uh, it's basically uh, red pepper spray to the 10th power. Uh, it's a canister that comes in the sleeve. We call it a holster. And the biggest mistake people have is, oh, I've got my bear spray, but it's in my backpack. That's not going right. to do you any good. So you always have to have it strapped to your backpack or your belt. And the other lesson learned with bear spray is when you take it out, most bears will charge you, but not attack you. And I've never of the 200, 250 days I've been in the park. I've never had a bear charge or even a close call. Partly is mm -hmm. I always travel in a group of 4 people and you always make noise. Wow. Yeah, and so you, uh, bear bells don't work. Uh, it, it's basically just singing songs, telling dirty jokes and having a great time. And uh, that will keep the most bears out of the way. Every once in a while, you just run into one. But having the bear spray, having it easy, you take it off. There's a trick. There's a trigger guard. You take that off and then you point the bear spray down. Um, did I did I mention to folks that I'm going to be doing this presentation? On April the 16th, did I mention that in the beginning? You did not. So for folks, uh, my oldest son lives in uh, Falls Church, Virginia, our oldest son. And on April the 16th at 1 o'clock at the Falls Church Library, I'm going to be doing this presentation in person. So if you'd like to meet John, you can join him there. Yeah. And I just put John's email address in the chat box. So for anybody who wants to reach out to him to ask a question about his presentation or a trip, feel free to do so. Any questions? Boy, this, boy. Ne this never happens. I know everyone's so quiet. <sighs> okay, here we go. I'm going to Utah next week. First time. So excited. I'll see you in Falls Church. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else shared that she got engaged at Zion, which I think is really neat. Oh, Zion would be a beautiful place to get engaged. Beautiful way to start a marriage. Absolutely. So, John, you talked about how the national parks are, you know, getting crowded and it's difficult to um, visit them in the summer because of the advanced plans you need. Are people starting to look at, to some alternatives that are just as beautiful? So, I, I'm really glad you mentioned that. I, I would encourage people to take the 62 national parks out on a list and you can do, you could do this the most visited national parks. I would avoid the top 10 hmm. and I would go to other parks. So Theodore Roosevelt Park is just beautiful. Um, Wind Cave, Jewel Cave up in the Blackland, uh, the Black Hills. But, you know, there are 400 national monuments. And they are just, you know, Grand Escalante, Bears Ear. Um, and then there are some stunning state parks out west, uh, Red Canyon outside of Las Vegas. So I think we really need, I mean, there's been a lot of literature on this. Once, once a place is designated a national park, it transitions it to a different status. Right. And we really need to rethink the Canadians are doing this really well. They really think, how do we become good stewards of the of the land we have? And, right. and what's happened in the United States is there's this duality of access and protection. And you can't have both. 
mm. because if you're having a, the infrastructure is not available and capable and it's not the capacity to sustain you know a million visitors a month in yellowstone it's just impossible to do so moving to reservations uh moving to a lottery uh putting restrictions on the number of people that can get in at certain times we can not so. do that but there's going to be a terrible price to pay all right i have a couple questions for you did you have any favorite national parks on the east coast Acadia is one park on our list. Any others that you would recommend? So if you take a look at the national park map, Acadia is the only one in New England. And then you've got the Shenandoah National Park down by you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Cuyahoga National Park. And then they just designated the New Gorge in West Virginia. Yeah, that looks so, beautiful. So that's the, yeah, that, I, I river rafted that one. Uh, not for the faint of heart. Uh, mm -hmm. Class book four yeah. and five rapids. Right, right. So those are the only national parks in the East. And then you've got the Everglades. And then, uh, you know, the most visited park in the country is, is, is the Great Smoky Mountains. So mm -hmm. I would avoid that at all cost. Yeah. Um, I have a disabled husband and a dad that is in his upper 70s. We wanted to go to Yellowstone, but hiking is not an option. What's the best park for us to go? So you can still have a great time in Yellowstone. But do it off season, and I would contact Yellowstone Forever. They're the 501c3, and um, for you, I would talk to them and say, here's, here's the situation I have uh, with the family with the disabilities and the restrictions. What would you recommend? And if you went out in May, early June, you could still see some beautiful country. You could still see some beautiful country. So don't don't be afraid to go to Yellowstone, but do it wisely. Choose wisely, as the movie says. Hello, I would like to ask John. I'm sorry, another question came in and knocked this one off. If he has personally seen the gray wolf population in Yellowstone increase over time, and if he has any experience in helping solve or track that specific problem in parks. So the, the, the wolves were reintroduced in 1996. Uh, uh, Dr. Doug Smith, if you Google Dr. Doug Smith and Yellowstone Wolves, you'll get the entire history of the restoration. Um, I have never been involved with the wolf restoration, although when you go in the park, uh, there are what we call the traditional wolf watchers. And there are literally thousands of people from around the world who plan their entire vacation to go to Yellowstone to watch the wolves and record the data that really helps scientists. Um, it's just phenomenal. And they're really great people. They have their scopes out. They're up at four o'clock in the morning. They often show up at Slough Creek, 30 or 40 of them. And with technology and social media now, it's pretty easy to see a wolf. My first, I would say my first 10 years in the park, and I've been there now 25 years, <clears throat> my first 15, maybe once every 10 times you'd see a wolf. Now it's pretty common, given the media and um, the access to GPS and, and the network to, to find out where the wolves are. It's quite a thrill to see a wolf in the wild. It's even more of a thrill to hear a wolf in the morning or the evening howling. If I want to go camping, can I just set up camp anywhere off trail or are there designated camping areas? Great question. Um, I was in, uh, here's a story. I'm, I, I had the Phillips Exeter Academy crew with me and they went off for the day and I was out hiking up by Gardner. And there was this young man in a backpack who started walking down the trail and we weren't too far into the park. And he said, do you know a good place to camp? And he was about 20 years old. And I said, what are you thinking? He says, well, I hitchhike out here. I'm going to go out to the wilderness and spend three nights camping. And I said, well, number one, you're going to die. And number <laughs> two, you have to have a permit. So in, in the parks now, there are designated backpacking wilderness permits that are available. And you get those through the National Park Service. Um, 
you know, he went out there, had none of the right equipment, you know, did not have bear spray, did not oh. have a rope, did not have a rope to hang his food. I mean, he was bear meat. That's scary. As I said, there's a lot of Darwin behavior. Oh, I hope he's okay. He was. I took him back into town. And I bought him a can of bear spray and I introduced him to a ranger. Oh, good. I hope somebody would do that for my knucklehead son, too. Yeah, I'm glad it has a happy ending. Does the Grand Canyon limit or meter entrance into the park? Um, I believe they're actually moving in that direction. Um, I know Arcadia. I know Rocky Mountain. I know Yosemite. Um, Zion now, of course, you have the shuttle. So what you do is you go to the National Park website for each of the parks and they'll have all the restrictions that you'll need to know. And it changes all the time. So do your homework. Okay. Any other questions? Where are you headed next, John? Rocky Mountain National Park. I'll be out there in June with the family. And then I'll be in uh, Yellowstone in Montana uh, most of October, fly fishing and hiking. I lived out west for a while, and those lightning storms in the afternoon do get to be pretty intense. And I, I remember that in Colorado. You really have to get an early start hiking. Yeah, you, it, it's, that's why one of my lessons learned is get up early. So yeah. particularly, particularly in the west across uh, Colorado, Mm -hmm. uh, Montana and uh, the Grand Tetons are notorious. I mean, there's a, if you do lightning strikes in the Grand Tetons, is the story of many mountain rescues. People get up, they don't get up early enough, and they find themselves on the face of 13,000 foot cliffs with yeah. lightning strikes all around them. So, a lot of the stuff you showed today. It looks pretty dangerous. It looks like you need to have some experience. How about if there's somebody who's athletic, who likes hiking and being out there yeah. and is capable, but not really up for some of that real scary stuff because lacks right. experience. So are there those kind of options, you know, in between driving through a national right. park and, you know, Yes. Hanging on to a chain, you know, all those feet above right. a drop. Right. So here's the first thing I would recommend to everybody to do is when you get to the park, there's always a visitor center. Go to the visitor center, get in line and talk to a ranger and say, I'm 35 years old. I have a ton of experience. I'm well prepared. What are the top three trails you would recommend? Next one, right. I'm 60 years old. I'm not really in great shape. I really want to do a modest hike for a mile, no elevation gain, and I don't want to get eaten by a bear. <clears throat> um, so the key is to go to, and if you remember one of my lessons learned, you know, respect your age, your yeah. ability, and your environment. <clears throat> so when you go to the park, uh, think about what you want to do. Think about the group of friends you're with and then set your expectations so that you don't put yourself or anybody else at risk. I tried to make that really clear. And so there's something to do for everybody. And yeah. one of the things that you know I highly recommend, as I said a couple of times, go to the local uh, 501c3 education arm. So uh, in Glacier, it's the Glacier Institute. And if you're in Yellowstone, you go to Yellowstone forever, but you know, there's nothing like being in a van, getting out of the van, walking a half mile, two miles, three miles with a naturalist who has yeah. bear spray, who's going to be able to say. And after you've done that a couple of times, then you'll yeah. feel pretty comfortable yeah. doing it yourself. What was the name of that group that you mentioned? Yellowstone Forever is the group in Yellowstone, but almost all of the national parks. My wife, Jennifer years ago the grand canyon has the grand canyon institute and she did a rim to rim oh. hike. and you know her, her lesson learned was they get up in the morning in the dark with with headlamps they would only hike till about 11 o'clock but one of her favorite stories is they were down at the colorado river and there was a group of uh, runners who were going to do the rim to rim in one day and one of their colleagues <clears throat> was in very bad shape and the guy that they were with actually had to throw her in the river because she was overheating and was 
really oh, ready wow. for, for heat exhaustion. So what month was that? that what, pardon me. What month was that? Did you say June? That, that was that was uh, late May. Oh wow! So, yes, okay. that's still. So, as I tried to say, you know, the parks are beautiful places, but they're they're park they're parks. <laughs> yeah. No. No. It's the natural world. Yeah. Anything else? Nothing else. Thank you okay. all so much for attending. Thank you, John. That was excellent information. And one more time, here is John's email. Whoops. John, tell me your email one more time. John, J O H N dot F as in Frank dot bunker at gmail.com. Right. All right, everybody. Good luck planning your own trips and right. Get up there and have a great time. But stay, but stay safe. Absolutely.